Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at BetterHelp.com slash Nerdery and Murdery. That's BetterHelp.com forward slash Nerdery and Murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Nerdery and Murdery modestly present episode 33. I thought I told you to go home. <laughs> but okay. All right, welcome to episode 33 of Nerdery and Murdery. Big 33! I am Zig with your nerdery. You're questioning that? You're questioning your own name? Well, yes, because I'm Trey, and I, I was under the impression I was the nerdery. <laughs> welcome back, Trey. Hi, thanks, Thanks for Jeffrey. coming back for doing? this. I'm <laughs> Thank Jeffrey. you for coming back, sir. Hi, Zigo. I'm Jeffrey with your murdery, and we've, uh, we've asked Trey to come back for episode 33. Uh, really enjoyed... Uh, the MASH episode, uh, in, in your coverage of that, uh, learned some things that I didn't know before. So, uh, definitely, definitely welcome back. I appreciate you. you coming back to the show. Glad to be back. Um, uh, before we get into it, I, I was just curious, is, is anybody watching Marvel's What If? Yes. I love that show. Not, I'm not so much a comic book guy, so oh, man. talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, so yeah. the last one I saw was the zombie episode, which eh, that was was a myth for me. I, I don't think I've seen the zombie um, episode yet. Have you seen the Doctor Strange one, though? Yeah. Dude, that one was dark. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go back and look at the, the, the what if episodes, it's... So... <sighs> How what if works is there's this central character called. It's all Marvel universe. Yeah, it's, right. so it's, I know right. I know generally the yeah. characters. I don't live under well, you know, a rock. Who, who but I, the I, Watcher yeah. will uh-huh. give you. This is what would happen if if uh-huh. if if it's if a, it's the Star a, Trek show we always wanted to make about 
what if this were what if that or yes. playing with the yeah okay. well and the central so theme of what if i mean it goes back to the comic i used yeah. i used to be an yeah. avid reader of the what if comic i mm-hmm. i had a poll forum at uh, at heroes comic book shop in fort worth <clears throat> r.i.p heroes um but <laughs> but what if takes a single event and changes that event to to show what would have happened instead right um, and you know, like in the very first one, instead of Steve Rogers getting the super soldier serum, Peggy Carter gets it and she becomes Captain America. And it's just, oh, she, that wow. one was brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. she becomes Captain Britain. Actually. Come, so, yeah. She really becomes Captain yeah. Britain, but, but yeah. yeah, but the one with Dr. Strange was, was brilliant. Brilliant, so they're brilliant. so they're so they're they're just expanding the universe by playing the what if game. Yes, yeah. correct. Yes, and correct. they've been doing it since uh. the sixties. Oh, wow. oh, oh so this is remember. a thing that's been around. Yeah, okay. I got into what uh. if in the in, in either the eighties or the nineties. Yeah. Uh, I didn't go back that far with what if, but I was really excited when I, I saw am it was Utu the Watcher. He oh, it's actu- great. The he great, was actually in the great Jeffrey Wright. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, if you ever watched the old uh, Fantastic Four cartoons from back in the late 60s, early 70s. Vaguely. Yeah. yeah. The, the one where they meet Galactus, Uatu is actually in oh. that. They, That's they how were, far back know, he goes. That, that I, I remember those cartoons mainly because they were on between something and something else that I wanted to watch. Right on. I was never a superhero guy. For me, for me, superheroes kind of begins and ends in Batman and that. Right on. That's fair. Just about it. Oh gosh, not me. Yeah. I, I, I'm a huge, yeah. huge oh, I'm, comic book hey, fan. Hey, you know what? You and billions of other people. Right. It's a thing, man. Right. I, I get it. I just doesn't interest me. It's well, and, and 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 that's why I was so happy that John Favreau came in and did Iron Man, yeah. and we finally had a great. Yeah, because movie. he's a because yeah, he's a and comic I do book yeah, because and I do like fan. and I do like the original Iron Man. I like Guardians of the Galaxy. I like individual movies. Yeah, but I am I but I haven't seen all of the Marvel movies. I have no idea of really any of the extended universe that I see go by on Reddit, and I'm sure. like, oh, I can skip that story. <laughs> uh, I, lo- I love them all. Skip that thread. I love but, them. Yeah. Well, glad you're liking what if I just, uh, yeah, I'd, you know, I put it out there on our Facebook uh, to see if there was anybody else watching the show because oh. it's just been what what uh, who's it what platforms are on who's who's Disney producing Plus. It? Disney oh, Plus okay. the mouse uh, it, the it mouse house owns uh, it all yes, they yeah. own it all now yes they ruined the Muppet anyway uh, <laughs> don't get me started on uh, yeah, that I know uh, <clears throat> Muppets is another episode oh, we should cover oh god, oh, god yes. Yeah. <laughs> We could probably Dude, do. Dude, I'm doing we, one on Miami Vice and Michael Mann. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. But the Muppets for sure. Uh, so, you, you, what are you gonna paint yourself teal and pink and walk around with a flamingo? Okay, all day? I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, for, I'm okay with that. As yes. long as he does, as long as he doesn't show up in a t-shirt and a white sport coat, where I, I, yes, would, I would. And I would. Well, I was. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Captain. Yes, thank you. Yes, and <laughs> I also want to cover um, some other Michael Mann stuff because I think Michael Mann's a genius. Yeah, I, Crime Story was brilliant. Oh god, brilliant! Yeah, I, I got I got eighteen pages on all we, that. We could so. we could we could do a whole series on Quinn Martin Productions too, yes. or Jack Webb for that matter, because you got Dragnet, you got uh, Emergency, you got Adam Twelve. Well, an emerg- emergency is fascinating because emergency is the reason we have. EMTs are a real thing now mm-hmm. is because that wasn't a thing when emergency went on the air. It was very rare. California was one of the yeah. first places to actually sit and think, you know, maybe we should have like kind of trained medical people show up at medical yeah, emergencies. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, and because and directly because of emergency, the rest of the country started adopting. And boy, there's your tangent for the day. Oh, yeah. Thanks, yeah. sir. Yeah. Well, Crime Story, actually, just to go back, because Crime yeah, Story yeah. has one of the best opening main character lines ever on TV. And I and I can't remember the exact quote, but I'm getting close. But he's basically talking to uh, someone who has hostages inside of this building. And he tells the uh, the, the the bad guy, he goes that, uh, you know, if you don't let these hostages go or if any of these hostages are hurt or anything like that, 
I'm going to go find whatever it is in this life that you love most and kill it. <laughs> the, I like it. In this scary, flat yes. Chicago accent. And it's, oh. oh. Dennis that, Farina. Yeah. Dennis Farina. Oh, okay. He's the yeah, one who right. that line. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Dennis Haven't seen Farina. Crime Story, but all right. Oh, yeah. Crime Story is <laughs> great. Crime Story is great. The theme song. Yeah, and, oh. yeah it's Del okay. Shannon's Runaway. Uh, oh, uh, a, a, oh a, that show. But an 80s okay. to up. Yeah. An 80s yeah, to up yeah, version. Yeah, and that's, okay, I, I prefer that, that version. I do too. I do that show. So it's great. I, so. See, they, it, it was at that period that I was more watching, like you know, Love Boat and Silver Spoons. So yes. I was, right you know, I, was I was always the sitcom. I love those the shows too. Dark. Yeah, I love those shows too. We could probably do an episode on Love Boat, <laughs> uh, Fantasy Island. They've got a new one of that out. Oh, Again? I know they keep yeah. trying to reboot that show. And um, I just, oh. uh, Mr. Rourke is now Miss Rourke. Yep. Okay. So I haven't seen. I haven't seen the tattoo character. I haven't watched it yet. It's on. I watched the one with Malcolm McDowell. Love and that it was one. Okay. Oh, I love that one. I that uh, one was right. especially dark, and I yeah. really, really liked it because that one really played on the fact that Mr. Rourke was a mystical figure. You yeah, know, in the original, it made him, it made, there was actual magic in him. Yeah, well, I mean, in the original seventies one, one of my favorite episodes is the one where Mr. Rourke went toe to toe with the devil. Yeah, you know, it's I love that episode. Um, and I, I, I did. I love the uh, I, I love the one with Malcolm McDowell. I've yet to watch the new one, but I kind of plan to sit down and yeah. give yeah, it a shot. Check that out. Is, it, it. is it a limited run series, or is it something they're going to try to keep bringing I'm, I'm assuming they're going to keep trying to bring it back. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it is a formula you could do a lot with. You sure. bring yeah. strangers to the island, and they've got this. It's, you know, it's the right. same reason the town setting works. You yeah. Know, anything, you bring people in. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Huh. Cool. Wow. Rebooting Fantasy Island. Our childhood just keeps getting yeah. remade. Oh, I know. I know. I know it does. All, all the reboots. So, Well, Zig, we're going to go away from you this week. And, uh, oh, no. Oh, no, don't. You're not going to go away. We're gonna got, I'm sure you've got plenty to say about uh, this. Oh, I one. have 24 pages. Yeah. We're, I, I don't have 24 pages, but mine are handwritten. Well, <laughs> well, Trey will hand the use show. It just on a, use it just on a phone, man. We'll hand the show uh, over to you for the nerdery side of the house. So it's nerdery, all yours. Nerdery today is uh, Stan Freeberg. Uh, a subject I don't this, know that I know anything about, yeah, but I probably yeah, this will. This is going to be a lot of fun. I've been a fan of Stan Freeberg since I was knee high to myself. I mean, I, I, uh, um, I discovered the album Stan Freeberg modestly presents the United States of America. Yeah. Volume it's... one, the early years, which is the title of the album. Yeah. And, uh, I discovered that at the Fort Worth public library when I was probably nine, 10 years old, didn't get half the jokes because the record was so badly scratched. It would skip whole punchlines. Oh. Um, but uh, it was a real revelation when I finally got it on cassette. It was a, it was a real, real eye on it. But um, it is probably one of the most sublime comedy albums that has ever been made. Real revolution? Do you think it would work better if we, you know, put a little music on it? It maybe, yeah, a little. <laughs> you know, we all want to save the world. Eh. Uh, <laughs> We're doing anyway, Stan Freeberg bits. Yeah. <laughs> Stanley Freeberg was born in Pasadena, California in 1926. Um, and he kind of had, he was just a suburban kid. You know, he, he, uh, he was kind of a nerdy kid when being the nerdy kid actually got you beat up. Um, he was, I mean, I, I'm, not say, I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm not saying 80s. that doesn't happen now, but I'm, you know, um, he was always kind of the kid who learned how to be a smart ass because, you know, that was his defense was being funny. Uh, like a lot of comedians do, you know, that was his thing. Anyway, he caught a bus. The story that he tells is he caught a bus from Pasadena, told the driver to drop him off in Hollywood, walked in, got an audition, walked into a talent agency, got an audition that day, and was working for Warner Brothers with Mel Blanc within like a week. Uh, and, you know, Mel Blanc is pretty much the voiceover for animation for the late 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, you could pretty much bet that it's Mel Blanc, but we're probably going to get to about a half a dozen other people that will make your eyes fall out of your head because you don't know the names. Dawes but Butler. Dawes Butler, among other. I had to give extra room to Dawes Butler. Anyway, so um, I thought what would be kind of fun for his early career, he spent the early 1940s, so we're in the early 1940s. Mm-hmm. 
and he's working at Warner Brothers Animation. So, if I say the Goofy Gophers, do you remember the Goofy Gophers, the two polite Gophers that oh thank you very much oh yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. all right well, oh no I that said was stuff to you yeah yes I remember them Stan Freeberg and Mel Blanc okay uh Pete Puma I remember Pete yeah. Puma yeah. you remember Junior Bear yes yeah Junior Bear that was him uh Hubie and Birdie the two hmm. little mice they're all again two little mice yeah 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 Boydy yeah I understand yeah Boydy I think I remember not, um not sure or Hubie yeah yeah Hubie because he was Birdie he was Spike the dog. Tom and Jerry? Uh, oh no, he was Chester. Was oh, okay. Spike the dog and Chester? You know the little dog. The, the, the Chester was the little yappy dog. Spike was the big bulldog. Come on, Spike! Come on, Spike! Oh, Spike! Yeah, Spike! Yeah, he's yeah, jumping yeah. up and down yeah. over him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Spike. Like, nah. Right. Yeah, Stan Freeberg was Chester. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but what you might, I know, will set you off. I will love him and hug him and really? pet him. And the abominable kid. snowman. Yeah. He was the That's abominable Stan snowman. The- We've and the said abominable, that line for yeah, years. abominable bunny. Yeah, he would. That was his line. So that's his early career. Okay, right. So he's already done all this great voiceover work. He did a little bit of limited film work across his career. Most notably, he had a non-speaking role in "It's a Mad, 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 Mad it's World," a mad, which mad, has mad, every mad comedian world. in the whole universe in it. Right. But he had for a guy who was known for talking. He has he, all he is is in the sheriff's office in Crockett County. He's sitting in the background and he just sits there. <laughs> and he's still funny. Yeah. He is also he is also the voice of a dispatcher, but it's way in the background and it's a blink if you miss it kind of thing, but he's in there. And according to Wikipedia, and this is what I this is the this is the Star Wars tie in I teased you with a minute ago. According to Wikipedia, so you could take this with however big a salt lick you want to take it. Contrary to popular belief, George Lucas called upon Stan Freeberg, not Mel Blanc, to audition for the role of C-3PO. After he and many others had auditioned, it was Freeberg who suggested that Lucas actually use Anthony Daniels' yes. voice. Uh, yeah, it was Freeberg that, that put Lucas that was to... That was like, no, Anthony Daniels has the perfect voice for C-3PO. You really need to make C-3PO the stuffy British mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, kind of fop, you know? Yeah. Because that's, because that's the kind of character dynamic that's, that they, yeah, that's that the they had set up. Yeah. And it, 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 so it took Stan Freeberg to point that out to George Lucas, which I think is interesting. one, of the, yeah. the, one interesting. of the cooler facts that I found about um, Stan Freeberg. And then you get into the 50s, and he gets a contract to do singles with Capitol Records. And they called it their spoken word department, but he's doing song satires and sketches and stuff like that. His first big hit, which was one of the very first comedy albums to win a gold, uh, uh, to get gold record status, was John and Marcia, which is basically a soap opera, radio soap opera parody where Stan Freeberg does both voices. He does John's voice, Marsha's voice. That used to play on Dr. Demento. Yeah, Dr. Demento played a lot of Stan Freeberg stuff. Um, but it's John, Marsha. Oh, I remember John, that. Yeah, John, yeah I remember John, that. Yeah. John, John. And, and, and the, my favorite one is where she's going, John, 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 Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Um, but it's, um, yeah, that's that one actually was like when Capitol Records was kind of like, hey, we've got something. We need to really give this guy some budgets. Yeah. The next big thing that he was known for uh, were the Dragnet parodies. Uh, St. George and the Dragonette, Little Blue Riding Hood, and uh, there was a Christmas uh, Dragnet one. He actually had Jack Webb's approval to use the orchestra and all of the orchestrations because Mm -hmm. Jack Webb, contrary to his performance on Dragnet, had a great sense of humor, particularly about what he was doing. He knew how square some of the stuff he was doing came off. So when Freeberg approached him, he was like, I was wondering when you'd get to me yeah. <laughs> to make fun of me. But St. George and the Dragonette uh, and Christmas Dragnet still has one of my favorite lines in it is, you know, most folks call them green onions, but they're really scallions. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's, it, that's one, you know, the, the sidekick character, that's all I can say. St. George and the Dragonette's a lot of fun. Um, 
Little Blue Riding Hood is I kind of a stab. I yeah. want to say the Christmas one is on one of the Dr. Demento Christmas albums. It is. Albums. It's on yeah. It's on the Dr. Demento Christmas album. And um, St. George and the Dragonettes on... It keeps making Dr. Demento top ten lists. Yeah. You know, Dr. Demento, he's all online now, but yeah. he's still around. But yeah, St. George and the Dragonette still makes, you know. And the other most interesting thing is that Just the Facts, ma'am really wasn't a part of Dragnet until Stan Freeberg wrote the line, used it in his parodies, and Jack Webb felt like he started having to write it into the shows <laughs> because people kept coming up to him and going, just the facts, ma'am. And so he actually ended up writing it in the shows because of Stan Freeberg. He had used it like once, yeah. I think, and, and, and probably on the radio show, as close as I could tell. Because Dragnet was a radio show first. Right. Yeah. And actually, the parodies are parodying more the radio show than the television show. Mm -hmm. The television show wasn't a thing until the mid-50s. It was on for a couple of years, and then it came back in the 60s. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, it, it, was, it, and it was always on radio all the way through that first television attempt. Um, so if you ever see Dragnet that's black and white, that's its first run. The second time it came back, it was in color. Okay. Um, he he pissed off Harry Belafonte by doing a a, a really great send up of the banana boats on Deo oh with God, the I love with that the um, with the um, oh God who is no, what's man. the name of the, hang on desperately digging for a name hang on um, I've got that I've got it I've got it I've got it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it oh where the hell um try we're gonna edit this out it. anyway <laughs> it's, yeah um, but Maybe. the guy I, I don't remember the I don't remember which one of his pretenders. ensemble played uh uh. The 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 uh, drummer, the bongo drummer. Who's no like, man, too piercing, it, man. It's, it's too, too loud. loud. It's too loud, piercing, man. man. So he had to run um, out the room and go. I, Daylight comes. That's the I very song, much man. remember that. Uh, yeah, um, I used to. I, I used to listen to Doctor Demento every yeah. Sunday oh, night. Yeah. Well, then you probably heard an awful lot of Stan Freeberg oh, without sure. really registering that that's right. what you're hearing. Um, he. Uh, you know, all the way through all of these, it bears mentioning that his his orchestrator and orchestra leader was Billy May, who was also the orchestra leader with, oh, you know, Frank Sinatra, Dean yeah. Martin, yeah. Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. So the reason that the music is always so good is because he's got Billy May backing him up. And even when he's sending up the pop songs and stuff, uh, mm -hmm. because he did uh, Elvis send ups, he did, uh, you know, uh, let's see, he did Elvis send ups, he did uh, The Great Pretender. Great Pretender. He did uh, The Great Pretender is the one's the great because it's, it's got the piano player. You mean I have to play this plink, 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 plink jazz through the whole number? <laughs> <laughs> plink, 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 plink. And then he starts playing Lullaby of Birdland. And, <laughs> and the Yellow Rose of Texas, oh my God, the Yellow Rose of Texas. It, you can and because he's got the snare drummer that keeps playing too loud and playing over things. And finally, the the singer who is Stan Freeberg doing the very stereotypical fifties Texas voice and uh, very shouty. And uh, he says, uh, and "The Ooh, snare uh, drummer shouty? keeps no. yeah the 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 snare drummer keeps playing louder and louder and louder. And finally, he snare drums too loud over Texas, and the singer just goes, "You can block out yellow, you can block out rose, buddy, buddy, but you can't block out." Texas. It's like that damn indie <laughs> song where the drums were too damn loud. Yeah. Oh. Hated that song because of the drums. I yeah. changed that uh, recording in the list. Okay. So uh, yeah, I want to hear the other one. Um, but he did an awful lot of mocking of uh, McCarthyism because that was a thing at the time. Yeah. Uh, he oh, did a gosh, great yes. bit. He did a great bit that was not a musical thing, but it was called Point of Order. And it was uh, as Baba Black Sheep being interviewed about his three bags of wool. And 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 Freeberg is in the back just being McCarthy. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order. Um, and it just devolves into nonsense. Twice, Capitol Records refused to release parodies that he had recorded. Oh. Um, one was a parody of um, uh, Arthur Godfrey, uh, where the little announcer guy is this like sycophantic sort of, yes, Mr. Godfrey. Yes, Mr. Godfrey. And the other one was uh, Ed Sullivan. And it was an Ed Sullivan spoof where every act he had was, well, you know, it was in England. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but what he was, and, you know, you go and you, they were finally released on the box set. And what you realize is that Capitol Records was really probably just protecting CBS's property. Yeah. Because really, to be honest, both of them are pretty mild as parodies go. Yeah. 
um, they're actually not nearly as barbed as a lot of his later stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they're certainly not as barbed as Green Christmas, which we could almost do a whole episode on by itself. But it's the one where it's the ad guys sitting around a table talking about all the ad campaigns for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they keep coming up with, you know, Santa Claus with the cigarettes coming out of his pack and the, you know, the three, and it's it just, it's all the over the top advertising things. And then finally there's this one guy at the end that, go, that keeps going, you know, that's not what the season's about. <laughs> you know? And it's, 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 it was recorded after his radio show got canceled because he didn't want, uh, he didn't want to take cigarette companies as ad yeah. uh, as advertisers. And when he replaced Jack Benny in 1957, the network in a radio show, the network gave him all kinds of hell about it. But for six weeks, he was the last real radio variety show on the air. And mm -hmm. then after him and after they canceled him, that was pretty much it for radio variety shows. Yeah, we don't, mm. we don't have everything was television. Yeah. We don't have radio. Um, yeah. Radio shows. Anymore. Everything was but television. That's, that's what this has become. Yeah. Podcasts have become the new, radio show oh, yeah. yeah 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 absolutely and then he did a little bit of television from 1949 to 1950 55 he worked with bob clampett as a puppeteer so you know bob clampett is an, an animator he worked yeah. with warner brothers he did directed a lot of warner brothers cartoons yeah but he was also a puppeteer and yeah. they did a kid show called time for beanie which no, was no, no, kind of uh no, no. You, no, beanie really, and cecil no just beanie yeah oh. beanie and cecil okay yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Time for beanie. yeah i know yeah, beanie, beanie and cecil, and cecil yeah uh, real bad old rotoscopes is mm -hmm. about all you can see of them anymore. And they were kind of the prototype edgy kid show that adults can watch too. Mm -hmm. Einstein was apparently a fan. Interrupted wow. an interview once saying, excuse me, it's time for Beanie. <laughs> um, yeah. I, that, and that's actually like a verified thing. That's like in several different sources oh, wow. have that listed as a legit sort of thing. Then he started an advertising company called Freeberg Limited, but not very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, he did ads for General Motors, Mellon Bank, Butternut Coffee, Contadina Tomato Paste. How did they get eight tomatoes in that tiny little can? Uh, Gino's Pizza Rolls. The P Gino's Pizza Rolls are absolutely hilarious because um, they, they do the breaking the fourth wall with the narrator. But the narrator almost always ends up getting beat up for being obnoxious. Huh? Uh, they're pretty hilarious. Uh, he did uh, a couple of ad he did a lot of ads for Sunsweet Prunes. Uh, Today the pits, tomorrow the wrinkles was their tagline. <laughs> but he also did a couple of television commercials for Sunsweet Prunes with Ray Bradbury. What? Yeah. Really? Um, Ray Bradbury and Stan Freeberg were very good friends. Stan Freeberg was a big sci-fi fan. He had met Bradbury sometime when they were younger because they both were California. And uh, so they knew each other and they had a very similar sense of humor because mm -hmm. uh, Bradbury's a funny guy. I don't know yeah. if you know Bradbury. I didn't know that at all. Yeah. No. You really wouldn't know it much by his works. There's some funny stuff in his writing, but no, but he was I, a funny I guy. I imagined Ray Bradbury to be very... Dry, and no, he straight could be. Lace. No, he could be. He's kind of. It's funny. He's kind of got this high squeaky voice, and he sounds like. Uh, he sounds like a children's announcer almost. He's How this funny. guy. Yes. He sort of talks like this. Yeah. I never yeah. would have expected. Yeah, that. he's. You, yeah, you, you. You have to see the little title card that says Ray Bradbury before you go, because he doesn't look it either. He's a very avuncular. Sort of almost Charles Schultz or Mr. Rogers looking. Yeah, you're guy. actually ruining my visual imagery of Ray Bradbury right now. I, I, I think it only makes it better because you know all that genius comes out of a guy who looks so normal and is kind of just a funny guy. But he was actually in, and the, he didn't want to do commercials. Yeah. No. And and Stan Freeberg had been bugging him for years to do them, and he finally said, "Look, I've come up with with two commercials that I want you to do. I'm calling them a brave new prune." And the title, the title was what got Bradbury to accept. Because Sorry, it you can't him up. see me shaking my head back yeah. and forth on that one. I think everybody can hear it. <laughs> there was a sonic boom. When you, no, um, that, that sonic boom was me hitting my mic. Um, it happens. Uh, he also did. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we've lost. Hold on, yo, no, we've Do way we need lost. To push the he's, reset button on Ziggy. He's almost on the damn uh, floor. He's red. <laughs> I don't think he can he breathe. He can't even laugh out loud. He's snorting. 
Oh my lord! <laughs> I can't breathe. I can tell. <laughs> Take a sip of something. Gee, you know crickets. what's funny is I can tell you can't breathe, but I'm just sitting here in my chair going, "Fuck it, he can't breathe." What the f- <laughs> oh, don't make it worse. <laughs> We'll Not- talk amongst ourselves. Notice yeah. how little I moved. I know to help my buddy. I know who's well, I'm dying. Still, I'm still parked over here too. I'm, well, so I mean, yeah, William yeah. has. I mean, none of us have moved. Yeah. We've all just watched him. <laughs> William's all very Buddha-like over there, just hanging out. You know. Hello. All, all right. Okay. Okay. You okay now? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I was wow. gonna say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he also did a Heinz, a, a famous Heinz soup commercial. You may have caught YouTube throwing you with Ann Miller, where it's the husband coming home and asking his wife what's for dinner and what's so special about these soups. And it turns into this Ann Miller tap dance number where the kitchen breaks away and becomes this. You should go watch some of his ads. Uh, he also was very famous for the nine out of 10 doctors recommend Chung King, where the, the ad is a picture of nine of 10 doctors. Nine of them are Asian. <laughs> and one of them is a white guy. So nine out of ten. And he did a lot of really funny uh, uh, Chung King ads. Oh, my God. He won uh, the Clio Awards are the advertising awards. Yep. And he won 21 of them wow. for his oh, various wow. commercials over his advertising career, wow, yeah, which but... is a lot. Uh, and he really was responsible for funny television commercials. He's why there are funny television commercials today. Before then, ad men would argue with him. Mm-hmm. And tell him, no, 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 you you can't do funny because people won't remember it. They won't buy it. Uh, they'll never get it. But, and I'm quoting from a wonderful book called Seriously Funny by a guy named Gerald Nachman. You guys need to put the, the thing. But this is Gerald Nachman writing. Although the state agency types chose to regard his funny commercials as flukes, he presented a Freebergian commandment to all his advertisers. They could take an ad or leave it, but they couldn't change it. So if you hired Freeberg, you did whatever ad he came up with. Much like with if you hired Frank Lloyd Wright, you built whatever house he designed for sure. you. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't argue with Mr. Wright. You didn't argue with Mr. Freeberg. And he was really serious about being funny. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and he really believed that many serious things were better presented um, uh, as funny. He did a couple of ads for there was a uh, McGovern and somebody else were trying to get votes to end funding for the Vietnam War. And he did a couple of radio spots for them. And they're really kind of dark, but they're also hilariously funny. One of them is the Vietnamatic Three. And it just plays sounds of war and you have to turn it down. But you can't turn it off. You can go in another room. But when you're in the other room, you can still see it's it's about it's he's commenting on people's ambivalence sure. to the Vietnam War. You can still hear it, but the government keeps pushing it further and further into the background. And it the, it's really funny. It's that same kind of very deadpan mm-hmm. Freeberg delivery where it's, you know, the straight guy who's usually Peter Leeds um, is, uh, uh, you know, or Dawes Butler uh, on occasion. But it's in and they're really fascinating. Um you have to know the history behind them to get the jokes sure. because they're so topical that there's no reason to have them. But the the box set that I've got has a whole disc of just all the commercials. Oh, nice! And everything. It's like fifty four freaking tracks. But it's got wow. that. It's got the butternut, uh, uh, the butternut uh, coffee uh, Omaha, which is the which is where butternut coffee was based, and it's this. Uh, faux musical review of the history of all and interesting things in Omaha as if the as if like the the local you know uh uh booster club had produced it <laughs> right and at the end they're like they're doing this Guffman. whole thing yeah well and it, well yeah but the twist at the end is is you're listening to this whole thing and you're like oh my god this is a great comedy bit you know Omaha Omaha and then at the end you're like oh and there's kind of this little theme song that goes through it and at the end, you get to, oh, by the way, it's also the home of butternut coffee. And from now on, we're going to switch Omaha out for butternut. <laughs> and so the last verses are all an advertisement all of a sudden. It's really pretty ingenious. Um, but uh, Ernie Krovax, who's a great comedian in his own mm-hmm. right, once called Freeberg a multiple incarnation of Fred Allen, Don Quixote, and Donald Duck. <laughs> and Freeberg liked to say of his own uh, stuff, he said, my records are not released, they escape. <clears throat> but 
I think the best thing to talk about of Stan Freeberg in 1961, he released an album called Stan Freeberg Modestly Presents the United States of America, Volume 1, The Early Years. And it is a Broadway style musical review of Christopher Columbus to the end of the Revolutionary War as a musical comedy vaudeville kind of review radio show. And it is probably one of the most perfect comedy albums. It was selected ever. by the Library of Congress. Library of Congress. Yep. Library I think of I Congress. I remember the Chris Columbus part. Yeah. Yeah. You've probably heard it a lot. Yeah. You mean above everything else, this ship is. You mean on top of everything else, this ship is rigged. <laughs> um, rumble, rumble, rumble. Mutiny, mutiny, mutiny. That's I use oh, that yes, all the. I yes, use that I all the that. time. It's, there's rumblings of mutiny going on. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Mutiny, mutiny, mutiny. I'll just jump up here in the rigging and talk to the crew. You mean on top of everything else, this ship is rigged? Yes. What was that? French horns. No, no, no. The other thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you hand me that glass? No, no, no. The other one. Um, but it's, uh, were you going to go out on that show? <laughs> <laughs> we can we, put some music on it. We do reprise of song. That helps. But not much. No. I, you know, it's one of those you count. You, it's, it's one of those things where when you listen to it enough, you just start doing random lines from just it. Just bits. And it doesn't matter if they're in context or not because you crack yourself up. And it's, uh, it, it, the, the thing about it is it w- he, he had this to say in his autobiography. He wrote, the history teacher I was saddled with in high school simply managed to make United States history about as stimulating as a government brochure on the bull weevil. And so his goal with the United States of America was to skewer U.S. history, which he really does, and, you know, kind of point out, you know, some of the idiocy and hypocrisy. It was sort of the beginning of the pointing out of, you know, these people were not perfect people. George Washington comes off as kind of a preening executive right mm-hmm. <laughs> you know uh you know he's more worried about his appearance and the coat and and the boat like this little boat i picked out for you it's called popeye um <laughs> the boat man had. i you know there's all the great bits there's the yankee doodle bit with the the again the beatnik jazz guy who is like can't put up with yankee doodles marches he's like you know first of all a guy with a name like doodle <laughs> and it, it, and now what is it doodle says it ought to go yep up 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 and it ought to go scoopy doo be doo be doo oh boo boo yeah ooh ah ooh chicka boo um um i'm hip uh <laughs> It's where they. It's where there's a running Norman Rockwell gag through the album because you know Ben Franklin started the Saturday Evening Post. Norman mm-hmm. Rockwell very much later right. uh, did cover art for, but got famous doing cover sure. art yes. for Saturday Evening Post. And so the the Declaration of Independence sketch, Thomas Jefferson is visiting uh, um, uh, Ben Franklin to sign the Declaration of Independence as a petition, you know, sign a petition mm-hmm. and, and <laughs> to get the country going or something, I think is how he puts it. But he says, hey, did you see that new artist I sent by? And frankly, like, yeah, not Rockwell boys, skinny kid with a pipe. Yeah, he's too far out for me. <laughs> and and uh, Jefferson's like, yeah, yeah, I know, you got to play it safe. But then he comes back later at the very end, at the end of the Revolutionary War, to get the British to surrender they have the Rockwell, Rockwell coming and paint a backdrop of soldiers, and they're playing war sound effects <laughs> <laughs> to fool the British. Um, it's one of those albums that you you listen to it, and your first thought is, "Oh my God, I want to see this on stage." Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. your first thought. Yeah, mm-hmm. Freebird tried. Uh, David Merrick apparently was very interested in doing it, and you know, really, yeah. Thought it was great. Thought it was funny. Kept trying to rewrite Freeberg's jokes. Pissed Freeberg off, and yeah, it ended yeah. very badly. Well, yeah, well, why would you? Um, yeah, it never that? went anywhere. Why and would you? Rewrite, always, I, yeah, why would you the, rewrite his jokes? Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and and they had, and because they had to add a second act, it went through the Civil War. And apparently, David Merrick once said to Freeberg, "Take Lincoln out of the Civil War. He's not interesting." Y- yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. we're making um, the same face <laughs> now. To be now, to be fair, it was always the intention for there to be multiple albums. That's yes. why it was titled Volume One. Volume Two eventually happened in 1996. Yes, 
He we had some very interesting door, uh, voice people. David Ogden Steers is in it. Uh, there's several other, you know, kind of more modern actors in it. Uh, but it still got Dawes Butler and Peter uh, uh, um, uh, Jesse White was still alive, I think, at the time. Yeah. And, you know. Well, I know he was going to release um, it for the bicentennial. He just didn't get it done. It took yeah, 20 years he, to get it out. Yeah, he had a lot of problems getting it all written and recorded. But, you know, the timing isn't as sharp as it is on the first album. And the songs are not as punchy as the first one. And I think David Merrick might have been right about Lincoln not being funny because the Lincoln stuff is probably the worst part of it all. <laughs> the best the best parts the best parts of the second one are when he's making fun of the Industrial Revolution and the Gilded Age. Uh-huh. Because that's the beginning of advertising and the beginning of being sold to. And that was the thing that, that Freeberg did really well, yeah, did. was biting the hand that fed him, essentially, yeah. by making fun of ad men while being one at the same time. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, and, but it's not... Uh, Steven Spielberg is a known admirer of this album. Big influence of him. Richard Dreyfuss, uh, 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 the Beatles, all of the Beatles. Stan Freeberg tells a story in his autobiography of... He met George Harrison, mm -hmm. and George Harrison just like started quoting USA to him, like just, <laughs> wow. just, just quoting his lines to him. Like was so excited it's to really meet funny. him. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, and to his credit, Freeberg was like, "Who knew?" <laughs> you know? Did Freeberg do the the Will Reading sketch? Is that him? No, no, God, no. That's one of my favorites. Sorry, I didn't know if the that was what, you know what I'm talking sketch. about. Food to the head. Oh no, that's a that's a Canadian group called the Frantics. That was recorded in probably the late seventies, yeah, okay, or eighties. Okay, I I won't pin it down more than a decade and a half. Let's say mid seventies through eighties. Yeah. The Frantics were around for a while. They were an early kind of kids in the hall style improv group. Yeah, could, yeah. that that ended up working up some routines that got recorded. And there's boot to the head. There's a there's a song that goes with boot to the head that came later. Boot to the head. There, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. There's one that's two guys riding on a bus where one guy is making dirty jokes out of all the newspaper headlines. You kind of have to, you have to hear it, but the best line in it is, uh, it's what the straight man says something and he says that, and then he makes a dirty joke. He says, that's not dirty. And he says, well, it is if you say it right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and then they did another one that's just two guys standing in line and the one guy is so annoying that he sets this other guy off. And finally, I think I've heard that one. Yeah, yeah. They all got played on Dr. Demento. That's why yeah. I discovered right. the Frantics. And that's why I knew who you were talking okay. about. Okay, because yeah, that's where I heard it was Dr. Demento. Because the Frantics were one of the ones that, that, that at the time here, when we were kids, you know, I was sitting there with a tape recorder catching... The, you know, trying not right. to catch the ends of commercial or cut the intros off. I did too. Um, yeah, it's yeah, kindred spirits, man. We did that. Oh yeah, yeah because KZEW. Uh, yeah. Oh well, yeah. I um, mean, be, so so I think we. But I live for Doctor Demento. What was it? Sunday nights, I guess. Was Sunday I nights. Sunday, Sunday nights. nights before Doctor yeah. Ruth Westheimer. Oh, um, oh, that's right. Oh my god, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> that was the lead-in to Doctor Ruth Westheimer. Thank you. Oh, uh, what a perfect lead-in too. Really, <laughs> but but yes. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 we may have talked about this in an episode. I don't remember, but but originally, what I did is I had a cassette recorder mm -hmm. that I would set up in front of a speaker to a stereo, mm -hmm. and when there were things that I wanted to record off the radio, I'd hit record yeah. and recording straight that direction and try to cut off the commercials as well. The best it was either birthday, Christmas present I ever got was. A jam box mm -hmm. with a cassette deck in it that they, I could record, would record directly right from off the of radio. Air. Yep, I yep. I had a little yellow Sony one. God, because there were so Sony there were so yeah. many times where I'd be recording a song and my mom picks that moment to come in. It's like, mom, you know, <laughs> like the song was never going to come back on, or that's. The, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, like it's like pointing a video camera at your TV screen to catch something because you don't have a VCR. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then I upgraded to a dual deck cassette player, so not only yeah. could I record directly off the radio, but then. I I could edit it yep. onto. Wow, I, did, I was I a made early podcast. I just had the fader, <laughs> and I had, I, yeah, I did, and I had a, I had a uh, one of those, uh, you know, combo units uh -huh. that had a uh, uh, LP, eight track, and cassette mm -hmm. and radio. I had one of those, in the living and room. I could record any of those onto the cassette, yes. so I could really make mixes of oh, whatever yeah. Mix I tapes. wanted. I had oh, yeah. so many. I did. I did. Uh, I did New Year's Eve tapes for the, the uh, Scott Wheeler's house. New Year's. I did. Oh, the yeah, free, I did. 
I found, I went and found, and boy, this is a big tangent. Never mind. Freeberg? Who's that? <laughs> I went and found every version, because they had just come out with a box set. I found every version of Freebird that Leonard Skinner had ever recorded. Because <laughs> our group didn't sing Old Anxiety at New Year's Eve. We, we, sang, we sang Freebird. Because we were teenagers and strange. Yes. And we, and I guess it beats Old Anxiety. At least we know what Freebird means. Yes. Right. Um, but yeah, I had like, 45 minutes of Freebird? Yeah, 45 minutes, all standing in a circle, singing Freebird. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm okay with this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not anymore, but, you know. <laughs> I, I'm okay with it now, so. Doing, do, uh, yeah, taking turns doing uh, yeah, air guitar. The, right. Well, and all the different, you know, because there was the live version, there was the demo version, there was an acoustic version, there was the original version, there was, I, I mean, yeah, there was the radio edit, there was the extended edit, there, I mean, you know, there's like nine different. Oh yeah, we were about halfway. That was the that was the yeah. New Year's Eve that I punched Ethan. Yeah, the only time I've ever hit anybody. And, and then uh, we made bread. And, and then we made bread that morning. Yeah, it was, that was a good New Year's. <laughs> man. That bread. was that was a that yes. Was I remember at one point, uh, my ex girlfriend uh, Stacy looked at me and went, "How much free bird are you guys gonna do?" And I went, "All of it." All of it. Because <laughs> that was the request. And not only that, but I had made three ninety minute cassettes of just mixtape. Where I had, I had somewhere I had come across a CD of uh, old radio commercials mm -hmm. and old television themes. Mm -hmm. So I actually, for the New Year's, for the party leading up to midnight, I made three cassettes that were actual radio shows. Music, intros, I was the DJ, commercial breaks, the whole bit. Oh, they so, were great. Yeah, I did, yeah. I If, if it weren't for legalizing, legal wrangling and money, I would just... Do that is a podcast. Sure, any music I damn well feel like sure. playing, and I'm just going to talk. My uh, <laughs> my cousin and I did that as kids. We oh, had yeah. tapes and fun. tapes of our oh, own yeah. radio show, and yeah. the you know, radio I, show. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget. I mean, I was I was really kind of the I, I was the um, I was the stand up guy. Yeah, and my cousin was the voice and the right. comedy and everything, yeah. and yeah. we would just play off each other. We'd have our little segments, and then we'd play music. Yeah, and then we'd come back in and. Yeah, so, I, so you were doing the morning zoo show kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Weedy and the butt. Yep, exactly. Uh, who are you talking about? Oh, Freeberg. Stan Freeberg. Freeberg. Stan Freeberg, that guy. Yeah. Um, and the United States of America. I, I, you know, uh, Stan Freeberg, you know, if you listen to the Fire Sign Theater, which if you are not familiar with the Fire Sign Theater, you probably ought to be. Um, but because they're hilarious. Um, but if Fireside Theater, you know, pretty much any audio comedy, anything, I mean, he really set a particular way of comedy timing that relied a lot on gaps. You know, there's, there's all these gaps, which is one of the reasons that in my opinion, you would never be able to do USA on stage because of the pauses, because with the live audience, you destroy that razor sharp timing. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's every it's, bit it's of a it's lost. If it's a millisecond one way or the other, yeah, because they right. really are. Oh, trust me, I get that with this podcast <laughs> right here <laughs> when sometimes I have to I'm, edit out your pauses. Sometimes I am taking pauses because I'm trying to let them drop. But oh, I I know, I know what you're doing, and I know you're going to your next point. When I'm editing, sometimes it's madness. Sometimes Ziggy holds for laughs that are not there. Uh, I know. I know we do. They it's, are there. It's, 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 so you yeah, guys just serious. can't hear them. I know. I know. And, and We're I, not and talking I'm, about the ones in your head, man. We've had this discussion before. Most maddening thing is when it's a one second pause, but it sounds so dramatic, and I have to go back and listen to it about four times to find the exact second it starts. <laughs> and then it's good. And the exact yeah. second it stops. Yeah. You have you have to mentally be like, okay, when did Ziggy blink? It's maddening. And, um, You're welcome. <laughs> So I, I, um, I, we could go down all kinds of rabbit holes, but I'm going to go at some of the, some of the ensemble people that he worked with, because he worked with a pretty close knit group of about, I don't know, I guess there's a dozen names, but some of the big ones, again, this is just going to turn into me reading lists of names, but you know, Dawes Butler, right? So that's a name you're like, okay, Dawes Butler, who the hell is that? Well, he was Augie Doggy. He was the original Barney Rubble. He was Bingo on the Banana Splits. Okay, I know all He of was those. the original Captain Crunch. He was Huckleberry Hound. He was Quick Draw McGraw. He was Snaggletooth. Yeah. He was, he, he, he was also Baba Booey. 
um, or Baba <laughs> Louie. He was Wally Gator. He was Yogi Bear. He was Scooby Dunn. So he was big with Hanna Barbera. Yeah, he was a Hanna Barbera guy. And then there was, you know, but then there's people like Jesse White. You know, you think the name Jesse White. Do you remember the original Lonely Maytag repair guy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's Jesse White. Wow. If you go watch, I don't know, any given television show from the 50s, 60s, 70s, or early 80s through, he's going to be on it at some point. And yeah. his, his voice, if you remember that voice, is so distinct. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, June Foray, who was Rocky the Flying Squirrel, Natasha, okay. she was Cindy Lou Who, <clears throat> she was the granny in Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. She did a lot of work on Scooby Doo. She was Ursula on George of the Jungle. Mm -hmm. She was on The Simpsons. Um, and the best bit of trivia I found about June Foray was that, you know, in the original Pirates of the Caribbean ride, uh -huh. there's the dude getting dunked into the well, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. She's the wife. No, Carlos, no. That's June Foray. <laughs> Don't listen to them. That's June Foray doing that horribly stereotypical accent, but, you know, which has since been taken out. Paul Freeze. Here's another name. I know that. I Boris know that bad name. Enough, yes. Right? He was the voice of the cars in the movie The Great Race. Mm -hmm. He was Ludwig von Drake. Mm -hmm. He was the narrator, the straight up narrator for most of the Disney shorts subjects, especially the television ones. Um, he was Inspector Fenwick on Dudley Do Right. Uh, he was several characters in the animated version of The Hobbit and Return of the King. Yes. Yes, he was. Um, and he was. Pretty much all of the male voices for Rankin Bass cartoons. Mm -hmm. and really? And all the stop motion stuff. He was Santa Claus on the stop motion. And the Frosty the Snowman cartoon. He was Frosty and most of the adult characters, hmm. I think. Um, <clears throat> Byron Kane, who was the producer of Peter Gunn, was mostly his claim to fame. But he's also on, you know, United States of America. Um you know, a lot of these are character actors you would know more for recognize. Shep Mekin, who was voices on Ricky Tiki Tavi, and a lot of those Chuck Jones cartoons. Yeah, he, that that after after Jones after after, yeah. after Mel Blanc was not working so much anymore. Walter Tetley, who was uh, Sherman, you know, Peabody's mm -hmm. boy on the Sherman and Peabody yep. of the Wayback Machine. Yep, we, we uh, call it a also the original. We call it a, we call it a pod yeah. machine here. Yes. Uh, Walter Tetley is the guy who plays the kid in both of those bits. That there's a kid in. Uh, uh, United States of America. He's the kid drummer and he's yeah. the uh, Myron that's the, that's actually invented all the stuff yeah. for Franklin. How you get along with them glasses? I told you you'd like them once you got used to them. Uh, <laughs> I wish you wouldn't talk about these things to your father. Um, he was the original voice of Reddy Kilowatt. Um, and he specialized in doing things. Marvin Miller, who was the original voice of Robbie the Robot. Um, he and... Marvin Miller is one of my favorites because he won Grammys for his recordings of Dr. Seuss stories in the 60s. They're rare. They're hard to find. But if you can, in mm -hmm. the 1960s, Fox and Sox, uh, Horton Hatches and Egg, The Sneetches and, and uh, uh, Yertle the Turtle mm -hmm. were all recorded as audio recordings with some sound effects, kind of mm -hmm. as, you know, recorded guys. I had some of those when I was a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like that. that's oh, Marvin yeah. Miller. Okay. Reading those. You know his voice from there. Ray Bradbury, of course, because he did the Sun Sweet, Sweet Prunes thing. Right. But he also did a, a bit for public radio with Freeberg called the Freeberg Zone, where it's just the two of them caught in each other's science fiction dreams. <laughs> and it's it's not particularly funny, except that it's Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, uh, I, um, I, I think the best sum up of Stan Freeberg so that we can kind of get off of all of these tangents and get to that, that other thing that you guys do. Um, what is it? The murder side of the house. Bur burdery? I didn't bring my feathers, man. Burdery? Get out. Burdery. Get out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think before, before I get murdered, um, <laughs> before I get murdered, uh, Gerald Nackman had this, kind of summing up of Stan Freeberg, or Stan Freeberg summing himself up. Stan Freeberg, jack of all comedy trades, was born along with a cocksure attitude that propelled him forward the rest of his life. I had not yet heard the word chutzpah, he writes, but somehow I seemed to develop a lot of it growing up as a means of self-defense. Some years later at a dinner party in San Francisco, a lady commented to him in the middle of the story, I don't suppose you know the meaning of the word chutzpah. 
And Freeberg responded, my dear lady, I am the Southern California distributor. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll leave Mr. Freeberg. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Very good. Awesome. I like that one. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, that was one that, you know, I, I absolutely didn't know the name, but yeah, know I, so much. I, yeah. will, I will pull the audio files for the, the, the box set and send them to Zig. They are magic. That's and, cool. And on, if you're on Spotify, uh, History of the USA Volume 1 is oh, on Spotify. Absolutely. And it's, and it's actually the really high quality remastered ones. So yeah, as opposed nice. to the old vinyl. To the that old, I've got. to the old. Yeah, vinyl. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take a listen to that because I think the awesome. vinyl I've got is about like uh, your. The, the vinyl copy I have, I actually bought at the antique mall many years later, and it's in good shape, but it's also in a frame. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it's a great cover. Yeah. The album cover is terrific. It's got on the on the left hand side, it's got a a, a banner. That's kind of like an old fashioned vaudeville marquee sort of banner with everybody that's in it and all that in mm -hmm. the title. And then he's standing next to it, dressed in kind of the 60s button down ad man sort of thing with a USA shaped briefcase. It's, it's just great. Yeah. It, it's a great I'm gonna check Yeah, it out. that is actually, I have that picture for of that album. For Perfect. The, yeah. Perfect. Awesome. No, I'll yeah. check that out. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate that again. Um, oh, I oh, I'm whoop, sorry. Go I'm ahead. interrupting myself. I'm interrupting no, you. No, please go ahead. Well, one more is is everybody needs to look up the picture of the album cover. Stan Freeberg with the original cast. What is his? Oh, with the original cast. Oh, with the original cast. <laughs> That's funny. He's wearing a cast. Yes. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> And it's actually in color. That'll, if you, if you go, go find a color picture of yeah, it. Yeah, we got to put that up on the site, that. too. That's That and the, and the other I'm covered. All right, go murder cool. somebody. I mean, no, don't. I'm yeah. not going to murder like, anybody. Um, I'm not going to murder anybody. I think, today, I think right. Ziggy's got something to say. Don't you? Yes, I, 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 I loved that. That was wonderful. And now it's time for the murder. Sweet. There you go. There's your segue. That's, that wasn't as sexy as it normally is, but that's, that's true. We'll murder. forgive you this time. So for my piece of the show today, uh, I got my information off 48 Hours, a documentary, uh, Wikipedia, Rolling Stone Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, uh, the podcast, The History Chicks, uh, and the podcast, And This Is Why We Drink. I heard... Oh, that's uh, a good podcast. I, I love like And that. This Is Why We Drink. Yeah. I, I love them. Um, and, you know, they, they, they both inspired me to, to get my own take on this one. So for this, I'm just going to start with a limerick. Okay. And I think you'll know very quickly who this is. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Andrew Borden now is dead. Lizzie hit him on the head. Up in heaven, he will sing. On the gallows, she will swing. Oh, nice. We're covering Lizzie Borden today. Lizzie Borden. Oh, yes. So, in reality, Lizzie's stepmother only suffered 18 or 19 blows to the head, while her father suffered 9 to 10, well, or 10 enough. to 11. <laughs> yeah. It does. Uh, so who is Lizzie Borden? Uh, Lizzie Andrew Borden was born on July 19th, 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts, to Sarah Anthony Borden and Andrew Jackson Borden. Um, Fall River, it, it was a textile mill town. It was about yeah. 50 miles south of Boston. Uh, her father grew up in very, very modest surroundings uh, and struggled financially as a as a young man, uh, despite that he the fact he was the descendant of very wealthy and influential local residents. Um, this would really kind of come into play on him later. He uh -huh. he was very he was very miserly. Okay. Um, he did. Flint. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, he did eventually uh, prosper in the manufacture and sale of furniture and caskets, and then he became a very successful property developer. Um, he was the director of several textile mills, and he owned a considerable amount of commercial property. Uh, he was the president of the Union Savings Bank and director of the Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company, and his estate was valued at $300,000, which is today about $9 million. That's so, $300,000 in the 18. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't poor yeah. by any means. Uh, so, you know, as I said, he was wealthy, but he was very frugal. He chose to live in a house with his second wife, Abby Borden, uh, just a block from the center of town. So the center of town is where is where all the comings and goings are happening yeah. and, and the textiles and everything like that. There was an affluent area of town, uh, or, or excuse me, the center of town was kind of affluent, but the, really the wealthiest residents 
um, including Andrew's cousins, lived in uh, the more fashionable neighborhood, which was called The Hill. Okay. And that was farther from the industrial areas of the city. So, you, you know, and that's kind of where he just, he, he didn't, he, he didn't just throw his money out there. He could have lived on the hill. Yeah. Uh, no question he could have lived, but he chose to live a very modest uh, lifestyle. Okay. Uh, the house itself was very modest, even by 1890 standards, uh, with almost no indoor plumbing or gas lighting, uh, although this was very common for wealthy people at the time. Yeah, especially in the, the East. Uh-huh. Uh, he was known to be at the, quote, the extreme end of Yankee frugality. Wow. Nice. So he kept every nail he ever found. That's he, that's how he's yeah, portrayed. Every, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, um, you know, there's the Norm Abram kind of Yankee practicality that's actually useful. Right. Know? And and then there's apparently this dude. Yes. <laughs> um, Lizzie herself was really kind of a fairly unremarkable woman. Uh, she was unmarried. Uh, and she was active in the local church, uh, the Central Congregational Church. She was very involved in church activities, mm -hmm. uh, including teaching Sunday school to children of recent immigrants to the United States. Uh, she was involved in Christian organizations such as the Christian Endeavor Society, for which she was the secretary treasurer, um, and contemporary social movements such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Ooh, yes, and they could get it all show of their own, too. Yes. yes. Yes, they could. They absolutely could. And then she was finally uh, a member of the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission. Okay. Aww. So, you know, just, just, she's just kind of, kind of there, really. Uh, Emma Lenora Bo Borden was Lizzie's older sister, and she, she really kind of played a, a, a motherly role to Lizzie. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually on their mother's deathbed in 1863 where she made Emma promise that she would look after, quote, baby Lizzie. Uh, three years after the death of, uh, of Lizzie's mother, Sarah, uh, Andrew married Abby Durfee Gray. Uh, Lizzie called her stepmother Mrs. Borden. Never mom, stepmom, hmm. anything wow. like that. Um, and she, and, and she, they really didn't have a very cordial relationship at all. I'll bet not. Uh, Lizzie thought that Abby married her father for his wealth. Um, and Bridget Sullivan, uh, the, the the family called her Maggie. This was the Borden's uh, 25 year old live in maid. She would later testify that Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents. And when they did, it was very contentious and there was usually arguments that oh, would dear. happen. Yeah. In May of 1892, um, Andrew killed multiple pigeons in his barn with a hatchet, believing they were attracting local children to hunt them. Lizzie had recently built that roost for the pigeons, and it had been commonly recounted that she was very upset over this, but the accuracy of this has been disputed. How fast with a hatchet do you have to be to kill a pigeon? Yeah, think about that. Uh -huh. I, I'm just, I'm just, I, I see flailing and lots of flying feathers, but I don't see a lot of... Yeah. I, I mean, do you... Well, what if he's throwing them, though? I mean, think about how accurate you got to be if you're, you know, pigeon on the wing, you yeah. Well, I mean, imagine it would be heavy enough to, you know, knock it out of the sky and you could finish it off. But yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. I read several. That's, that's kind of creepy. I read several articles <laughs> that Lizzie was very traumatized over this. Yeah. But like I said, the, the accuracy Who of this whole thing, yeah. very disputed. Um, there was a family argument in 1892 that prompted both sisters to take extended vacations in New Bedford. Um, and then after returning to Fall River a week before the murders, Lizzie chose to stay in a local rooming house for four days mm -hmm. before returning to the family residence. Okay. Abby Borden herself is very often cast as the evil stepmother in many of the stories. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, before the murders, there had been uh, quite a bit of tension growing within the family, especially because Andrew was giving a lot of gifts of real estate to Abby's family. In various branches of Abby's family. Oh. Um, so I see where the divisions are beginning to develop. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, Andrew gave uh, Abby's sister a house, um, and the Borden sisters, the, both Abby and Lizzie, uh, or uh, Emma and Lizzie, uh, demanded to uh, to get a rental property themselves. Um, and it was they wanted the home that their mother lived in before they died. Uh, and they purchased it from their father for $1. Nice. <laughs> a few weeks before the murders, they sold the property back to their father for $5,000, which is the equivalent of 144000 today. That, that, that sounds yeah. like some sort of yeah. tax evasion yeah. or something. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's kind of suspicious. 
Uh, the night before the murders, John Morse, uh, the brother of Lizzie and Emma's deceased mother, so their uncle, John, uh, visited and was invited to stay for a few days to discuss business matters with Andrew. Some people have speculated that their conversation, particularly about the property transfer itself, may have aggravated an already tense situation in the house. Right on. Right on. Uh, then, for several days before the murders, the entire household had been violently ill. A family friend later said that uh, uh, that they had heard that there was mutton left on the stove that was to be used in meals over several days. So they think maybe food poisoning. Um but Abby herself feared that they were poisoned because Andrew was not a very popular man in town. <laughs> right. Huh. Yeah, go figure. Yeah. Uh, reportedly, before the murders, uh, Lizzie had gone and seen a friend, and supposedly out of nowhere, she volunteered to the friend that she had been feeling depressed and was so worried that a nameless, faceless, or she was so worried about nameless, faceless enemies that her father had. Before leaving her friend, she said, I'm afraid something's going to happen. Okay. Uh, John Morse, Uncle Uncle John, uh, he arrived the evening of August 3rd, and he slept in the guest room that night. After breakfast the next morning, uh, Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, John, and Bridget were all present. Uh, Andrew and John went to the sitting room where they chatted for nearly an hour. John left at around 8.48 a.m. to buy a pair of oxen and visit his niece in Fall, Ro- Fall River. Like you do. Like yeah. you do. But yeah, pair of oxen. I'm just going to go out and buy I'm a pair of oxen. A couple of ox. He had planned to return for lunch keep at in, I'll keep in the trunk until they come, until yeah, they yeah, home. Yeah. But it's not hot today. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, no, no. He, 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 he <laughs> Some, sometimes a I understand. just presents itself. Uh, he had planned to return <laughs> for lunch at noon. Uh, Andrew then left that morning for his morning walk. Uh, he used to go to the center of town sometime around 9 a.m. He'd walk around, look at his property, see right what on. was going on. Get a little exercise, get a little uh-huh. fresh air. Right on. Yeah. Um, so the cleaning of the guest room was one of Lizzie and Emma's regular chores. Um, but Abby herself went upstairs sometimes between 9 a.m. and 1030 a.m. to make the bed. Andrew returned in about 10.30 a.m., and his key failed to open the door, so he knocked. Hey, I need to come in the house. Um, Bridget, Maggie, uh, the, the, the live-in maid, uh, she went to unlock the door. She found it jammed and swore at it. Uh, she would later testify that she heard Lizzie laughing immediately after this. She did not see Lizzie, but stated the laughter was coming from the top of the stairs. And this is considered significant because Abby was already dead by this time. Uh, and her body would have been visible to anyone on the home's second floor. Really? Wow. Uh, Lizzie later denied being upstairs and testified that her father had asked where Abby was, and she replied that a messenger had delivered Abby a summons to visit a sick friend. Lizzie herself stated that... um, she had uh, she she had went to taken her father into the living room and removed his boots and helped him into his slippers before he lay down on the sofa for a nap. This was contradicted by crime scene photos, which show Andrew wearing boots. Uh-huh. Uh, she then informed Bridget of a department store sale and permitted her to go, but Bridget felt unwell and went to take a nap in the bedroom instead. Uh, Bridget later testified that she was in her third floor room resting from cleaning the windows and vomiting from spoiled mutton stew. Just before 11, 10 a.m., she heard Lizzie call from downstairs. Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. Um, Lizzie went to the side door of the house and told her next door neighbor, Adelaide Churchill, that her father had been killed. Adelaide Churchill stated that Lizzie had no blood on her and Lizzie looked perfectly presented. Okay. Um, somebody went to fetch the police, uh, and the family doctor while Adelaide, uh, came inside to comfort Lizzie. Um, as Lizzie was sitting at the kitchen table with Adelaide, Lizzie remarked that she thought that she thought she heard her stepmother come in. Uh, she initially reported hearing a groan or scraping noise or even a distress call before entering the house. Two hours later, she told police she had heard nothing and entered the house, not realizing anything was wrong. So her story gets a little weird. Um, Adelaide then asked Lizzie where her stepmother was, and she then said, oh yeah, my stepmother received, or Mrs. Borden, I guess she called her, received a note asking her to visit a sick friend. Mm -hmm. And so Lizzie said, you know, could somebody go upstairs and look for her? 
Uh, Adelaide and Bridget then went upstairs where they found Abby face down next to the bed, having suffered 18 to 19 blows to the back of her head. Wow. Uh, Dr. Bowen, the family physician, uh, arrived at home from the home from across the street to determine both victims had died. Uh, the detectives estimated that Andrew's death had occurred at approximately 11 o'clock a.m. Um, at the time, the, the crimes were so violent that rumors were around that Jack the Ripper had come to America. <laughs> <laughs> um, according to the forensics investigation, Abby was actually facing her killer at the time of the attack. She was first struck on the side of the head with a hatchet, uh, which cut her just above the ear, causing her to turn and fall face down on the floor, creating the contusions on her nose and her forehead. Her killer then struck her multiple times, delivering eight, 17 or 18 more direct hits to the back of her head, killing her. How do you count after you get to that many blows know, to that you, small? You, you, I'm thinking yeah. about the footprint of the back of my yeah. head. Yeah. And I'm like, how do you count 17 or 18 individual right. blows? You gotta get Doesn't like it a all just become bone and splinters and mush yeah. after a minute? Yeah, I mean, not that I, you do grab it. Because, yeah, I, wow. think it, I think that head was pretty chunky salsa at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I think uh, she's dead, Jim. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like hitting warp five with the uh, yeah, yeah without with, the without the inertial dampers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. just tomato sauce. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, Andrew himself was slumped on a couch in the downstairs sitting room. He was struck ten or eleven times with a hatchet like weapon. One of his eye this is wild. One of his eyeballs had been split cleanly in two, suggesting he had been asleep when attacked. His still bleeding wounds suggested a very recent attack. Wow. Wow. At the time of the murders, Emma, the sister, had been out of town for two weeks visiting friends about 15 miles away. There was no blood anywhere in the house except around the bodies. There was no blood splatter. Um, How? I I, I don't know. I don't know. Especially because, you know, your head will project a lot of blood. Yeah. Because that's where all of it's going. I mean, all you have to do is cut yourself shaving to understand yeah. how uh-huh. much head wounds bleed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, later Not on. Is, shave, but. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, later on, that's when they reported that no blood was found on Lizzie, except the police did find a minute spot of blood on, on Lizzie's undergarments. Lizzie later claimed that she was menstruating at the time. That was during a time, especially that that was. You just. You didn't that, talk about You didn't that. talk about yeah. that. So when she yeah. said she was menstruating, they're like, um, okay, okay, okay. And yeah, turn, yeah, turn their yeah, head away. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but that was the only blood that they found on her. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the crime itself suggested that the crime was personal, full of a lot of anger and a lot of rage. No, yeah. you think? Uh, the police first thought that it must be a deranged outsider because the crimes were so shocking. Uh, the Borden house was very quickly crowded with doctors, reporters, neighbors, and even passerbys contaminating the crime scene. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Uh, the police started. Thank taking, you, Barney Fife. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, police started taking samples of the carpet, blood stain, uh, blood stains, looking for any blood on any clothing. One thing did become very clear that Abby was killed before Andrew. Okay. Because uh, Andrew still had the oozing liquid blood from his injuries and was warm to the touch, while Abby had coagulated dark blood on her injuries and her body was cold to the touch. In the basement, police found two hatchets, two axes, and a hatchet head with a broken handle. The hatchet head ended up being suspected as the murder weapon as the break in the handle appeared fresh, um, and the ash on the dust on the head, unlike that of the other tools, appeared to have been deliberately put on the axe mm-hmm. in order to make it look like it had been in the basement for some time. Right on. So it looked like somebody had been trying to cover it up. Uh, the length of the cutting blade did seem consistent with the wounds on both Andrew and Abby. A lot of blades in this house. Oh. Uh, the house was triple locked at the front door, and the back door was locked. The only unlocked door was the side door, which is the one Lizzie went out of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To go get the neighbor. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And what do you so far? And then when no one's suspicious to be found, police then turned their attention to the two remaining people in the house, Bridget and Lizzie. Bridget or Maggie. Maggie, right. Yeah, because they called her Maggie. and I mean, I've called her Bridget throughout here. I, 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 I don't know why I did that. Um, Lizzie and Emma had a friend named Alice Russell who decided to stay with them for the night following the murders. Uh, Uncle John. Let's go stay in this murder house. Right. Uncle John spent the night in the attic guest room. Uh, there were accounts later that he slept in the murder site guest room, but that apparently wasn't, uh, wasn't correct. 
The bodies remained stretched out on mortician boards in the dining room. What the hell? Well, that wasn't uncommon at the time. Was it to not? sit up with the dead. Yeah, really. It, it was. It was not uncommon um, to to sit up with the dead, to have the dead, you know, embalmed, and then you have, you know, like like a modern day funeral home. You have the viewing. Mm-hmm. That's usually the the day yeah. before the funeral. Yeah. You have the viewing. Well, they used to do the viewing in the home. Okay, it, it, it's, it's a wake. It's it's a yeah. wake. My it's, great aunt Pearl and my great uncle Jack. Yeah, their viewings were in the but house. I mean, from a the, murder that scene, was though. back in the well, 70s, okay, now, early 80s. I, there I will give you. Right, that's yeah. creepy. But yeah. uh, but but the but the the practice in general was not uncommon at the time. Yeah. Huh. Um, particularly in rural areas, yeah. you know. Um, There's and it, Jerry Clower tells a hysterical story about. Claude and Eugene Ledbetter sitting up with the dead one night. And, oh my God! They take the they, they take the dead body. They want to go to a bar across the street, so they take the dead do a weekend at Bernie's. They take the dead bar the body of the bar. Well, they end up getting into a bar fight, and then they get this enemy of theirs arrested for killing the dead guy. Oh my God! <laughs> okay, it, it's I mean it's a he's a comedian, so it's a oh yeah, story. I know Jerry Clark. Anyway, I, I'm glad yeah. you knew that. I I just Woo! I saw that. Sorry, and I was like, no, that's that's <laughs> wow. not um, that's that's not actually, to my knowledge, a very uncommon thing to yeah. to to have the dead yeah. and to not you know we, what what you don't think about not to get too far deep into it, but what you don't think about is you know the the funeral industry as it is today is really new. Yeah, sure. And used sure. to be yeah. you know you had the you had the guy that would bury it. Uh, and, that's called a cemetery yeah, sextant, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we discovered it in an episode. Okay, a couple weeks ago. Weeks ago. All right, so you got a sextant somewhere and, you know, telling you the direction to the cemetery, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> wrong, anyway, wrong type. Yeah, yeah wrong, wrong sextant. Um, but, yeah, you know, you, you, you basically sextant, you had that. Sextant. You had, yeah, you had the undertaker, you know, sextant. That makes more sextant, sense. Sextant, yeah. yeah. Cemetery um, sextant. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that was not... But, but having the dead in the family home yeah. to have all the family come see them because... You know, it used to be you you that there was for a while in the Victorian period the fear of being buried alive. Right, 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 um, right. Which which was, was Hitchcock's or yeah, not Hitchcock which, uh, Poe's yeah, biggest which, fear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And but there was still a little bit of that kind of thing hanging on and lingering behind that. But mostly it was because the tradition was you have everybody come pay respects to the dead, and then mm-hmm. it's a much smaller burial gotcha and the, 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 you know the funeral service and the burial is really much more for the immediate family okay yeah. well so, all right yeah um, but it, but but they're murdered yeah uh, yeah right, right, right i imagine it was a closed casket <laughs> yeah just a hunch well they kept them on mortician boards <laughs> in the dining room oh my god uh police were stationed around the house on the night of august 4th Anybody hungry gross <laughs> Uh, police were stationed around the house on the night of August 4th, during which an officer said he saw Lizzie enter the cellar with Alice, carrying a kerosene lamp and a slop pail. He stated he saw both women exit the cellar, after which Lizzie returned alone, although he couldn't see what she was doing, but it looked like she was bent over a sink. On August 6th, 1892, Andrew and Abby were laid to rest while news of the murder was spreading across the country. Uh huh. The the I mean, well, the brutality of the murders yeah. were just yellow, headline. Yellow journalism Abs- was big. And that was absolutely perfect story for them. Yeah. Um, later, after uh, her father's funeral, Lizzie burned a dress in the kitchen stove. Lizzie and Emma claimed that the dress had been stained with paint and it needed to be burnt. Uh, police then conducted a more thorough search of the house, inspecting the sisters' clothing and confiscating the broken-handled hatchet head. And that evening, a police officer and the mayor visited the Borden house, and Lizzie was informed that she was a suspect in the murders. So then starting on August 8th, (laughs) bless you, uh, police held an inquest of Lizzie so that she could give her version of the morning events. Um, She asked to have her family attorney present, but that was refused. Because under a state statute, a uh, state statute provided that an inquest had to be held in private. So they did not allow her a lawyer for the inquest. Uh, huh. mo- most of the officers who interviewed Lizzie reported yeah. that they disliked her attitude. Most said she was too calm and poised and that it, her inability to summon a single tear aroused their suspicion. Well, it would me, uh, you know. Um, however, she had been prescribed regular doses of morphine to calm her nerves, and it's very possible that her testimony was affected by this. 
I, I, I'm so well, glad since that you put it that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am She's so glad out of her gourd. I, I'm so glad I don't have to take morphine for, for, for anxiety because I mean that morphine makes me violently ill. I mean, immediately I, the I, second I, it hits my bloodstream. I, I've had morphine once in my life and I don't remember much. Oh, I don't ever want is, it to get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they did say that her behavior was very erratic, that she often refused to answer a question, even if the answer would be beneficial to her, and that she often contradicted herself, providing alternating accounts of the morning in question, such as she said she was in the kitchen reading a magazine when her father arrived home, then she said she was in the dining room doing some ironing, and then she said she was coming down the stairs. It was here, uh, she also said she removed her father's boots and put slippers on him while the photographs clearly, the, the crime scene photographs clearly showed him wearing his boots. Yeah, he had his boots on. Yep. Um, also, Lizzie was reported to have tried to buy prussic acid at a pharmacy in the days before the murders, leading police to suspect that an axe was not the first weapon of choice. Um, in, 19, in, in 1892, prussic acid was a lethal poison and it was only available at a doctor's prescription. Uh, Lizzie said that she needed it to put an edge on a sealskin cape, which Lizzie did own. Uh, the pharmacist said he had never heard of it used that way and refused to sell it to her. However, there's no solid proof that this was Lizzie requesting the purchase, and her, def- and her defense would later claim that she was the victim of misidentification. Right on. Either that or anybody wants some mutton? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. That's another yeah, one. She got the dose off. <laughs> Uh, after the inquest, that didn't work. Must do something else, <laughs> right? Uh, after the inquest, the police decided they had enough on Lizzie, and they placed her under arrest for murder on August eleventh, eighteen ninety two, and she would spend the next nine months alone in a county jail in a nine and a half by seven and a half foot cell that mm-hmm. she stayed into until the trial. So if she wasn't crazy before, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Her trial began on June 5th, 1893 in New Bedford, Massachusetts Superior Court. Um, five days five days before the trial's commencement, another axe murder occurred in Fall River. Uh, this time the victim was Bertha Manchester, who was found hacked to death in her kitchen. And the similarities between the Manchester and Borden murders were very striking and noted by the jurors. Uh, however, Jose Correra de Mello, a Portuguese immigrant, was later convicted of Manchester's murder in 1894 and was determined to not have been in the vicinity of the Fall River at the time of the Borden murders. Wow. Okay. Um, again, the, the, the nationwide audience mm-hmm. for this, the, the trial itself uh, a, a attracted a massive crowd. Well, they, they, made, a, they made up a, a jump rope uh, rhyme about it so yeah i would think yeah. it kind of whatever one that i said at the very beginning yes yes uh reporters from all over the country were sent to massachusetts and people waited for hours in line to see what was being called the trial of the century uh, most of the people who arrived that were interested in the case were women uh, they were very interested because this seemed to be the trial of a woman who had transcended the limits of her sex in such a violent way Women were also interested to sit and watch because women were not allowed on the jury. Mm-hmm. Uh, women actually would in Massachusetts would not be allowed until 1951. What? Mm-hmm. God. That late? Yep. Okay. That's that seems about right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the it's wi- sad, but that seems about right. Oh yeah, but very true. Uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union and suffragists would prote- protest at protest at the trial, that Lizzie would not be judged by a jury of her peers. I completely agree with that. Uh, There was a panel of three judges and 12 jurors that heard the case. Um, The prosecution opened up with the simple premise that Lizzie was the only person with the opportunity and the motive to have committed the crimes. Uh, During his wrap-up of the opening statements, he alluded to the fact that he had the skulls of the victim in the courtroom. And then (laughs) then he proceeded to present them... Uh, the courtroom was visibly aghast, and Lizzie fainted. I, I would too. It's the skulls of her, you know, father yeah. and stepmother. Yeah, whether you did it or not, that's not yeah. the kind of thing you need to have no. thrown in your face, right? <laughs> uh, the prosecution during the trial would point. Well, go ahead. Face in the face. I'm just saying. You're an idiot. That's something thrown in your face. It was the skulls. Yeah, I've, I've been waiting for you to use that all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Now, you, now you've broken the seal, so it's just. <laughs> Uh, during the trial itself, the prosecution would point to the times of the death um, because if Andrew died first, then Abby's family would automatically inherit part of the board money. Huh. 
if Abby died first, then only the Borden women would inherit all the money. Interesting. Uh, they also gave evidence matching the skulls to the suspected murder weapon. However, the judges didn't allow all evidence to be viewed by the jury. Most notably, Lizzie's attempt to buy the prussic acid before the murders was not allowed in the trial. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the prosecution took nine days to deliver their side of the case. Uh, a prominent point of discussion in the trial was the hatchet that was found in the basement. Uh, but w it was not convincingly demonstrated by the prosecution to be the murder weapon. Uh, prosecutors argued that the killer had removed the handle because it would have been covered in blood. One officer testified that a hatchet handle was found near the hatchet head, but another officer contradicted this. Uh, although no bloody clothing was found at the scene, Alice Russell did testify that she witnessed Lizzie burn a dress in the kitchen stove, saying it had been ruined when she brushed against wet paint. Uh, the defense then tried pointing out that Lizzie was a perfectly ordinary person who was caught in this unbelievably hor horrible situation. Uh, they pointed to the fact that there was a lack of evidence. Uh, the, de the defense only took two days of witness testimony to make their case. They did put Emma, the sister, on the stand. Uh, she testified it was her idea to burn the dress. And according to testimony, uh, Maggie entered the second floor home at around 10.58 a.m. and left Lizzie and her father downstairs. Hmm. Um, Lizzie told several people that during this time that she went in, that, that, she, that Maggie went upstairs, uh, that she went into the barn and was not in the house for 20 minutes, possibly a half hour. Right. Hmm. Um, there was a Hyman Lubinsky who testified for the defense that he saw Lizzie leaving the barn at 11.03 a.m. And another witness, Charles Gardner, confirmed this time. Uh, at 11.10 a.m. is when Lizzie called uh, Maggie downstairs and told her Andrew had been murdered and ordered her to not enter the room. Instead, Lizzie sent her to get a doctor. Lizzie herself never testified. Hmm. That, that's common. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very common. Uh, after three weeks, the trial ended with closing arguments, and before the jury was released, uh, Lizzie did get in the last word, and she said, I am innocent. I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. Two hours later, the jury had reached a verdict. It was reported that the foreman looked as if he could not hold back his excitement as he blurted out, not guilty. <laughs> okay. Lizzie fell out of her chair, or fell to her chair, and put her head on the rail, and the courtroom erupted in cheers, as did the crowd outside. Huh. Um, until I'd heard this story, I always thought that she was found guilty. I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, she, was found innocent. Yeah. Yeah. she was found innocent. Um, after her acquittal, she did stay in Fall River, but not in the home her parents were murdered in. She and Emma promptly vacated the home. No. Uh, -huh. uh, they inherited, uh, 350,000 from her father's estate, which would be around 10 million today. Uh, a considerable settlement, however, was play, uh, paid to settle claim by Abby's family. Uh, Lizzie and Emma bought the house they always wanted at the top of the hill, uh -huh. which was much larger and a much more modern house. Mm. Uh, Lizzie changed her name from Lizzie to Lisbeth and named the house Mablecroft. Uh, they had a staff that included live-in maids, a housekeeper, and a coachman. Oh, well, how nice. Yes. yes. Um, it was... Or almost how twee. <laughs> it was kind of bad for Lizzie after that, though. The oh, yeah, everybody thought she did yeah. it. Oh, yeah, the community shunned her. Uh, yeah. the, you know, they, they all began wondering, if, if not Lizzie, then who? Yeah. Um, she found herself unwelcome at church, where she had spent all of her time. Uh, and, it, you know, that's pr provided her with the foundation uh, yeah. of her support at the trial. Uh, she was ostracized by the Fall River Society. Um, and she herself kind of became Fall River's curio a curiosity uh she was followed by street urchins and stared down whenever she appeared in public and she would hear those limmer that lot that, yeah. that rhyme everywhere wow. she went yeah uh okay. she would Oof. with yeah she would withdraw to her home and even there neighborhood kids still pestered lizzie with pranks um and then her name was brought up again in the public eye when she was accused in shoplift of shoplifting in 1897 in providence rhode, rhode island uh, but she apparently made restitution for that uh, 12 years after the murder, after the trial, uh, Emma and Lizzie had a falling out. Uh, Emma said she was very deeply troubled by something that was going on in the house. Right on. There was also an argument over a party Lizzie had given for actress Nance O'Neill. So Emma decided to sever all ties with her sister and leave Maplecroft. Hmm. 
Uh, Lizzie would never marry. Uh, she finished her life as a recluse, uh, alone in her home with her dogs until her death on June 1st, 1927, wow. uh, dying of yeah. pneumonia. Yeah, she lived a long time. She lived a long time. I didn't know she lived that long. Mm-hmm. Emma uh, moved to New Hampshire and died nine days later in a nursing home. Huh. Mm. At the time of her death, Lizzie was worth over 250000 or almost $5 million today. Uh, she owned a house on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars, and a large amount of jewelry. She left 30000 uh, which is the equivalent of 600000 a day, to the Fall River Animal Rescue League. And five hundred dollars, which is ten thousand a day, in a trust for the perpetual care of her father's grave. Her closest friend and a cousin each received six thousand, which was about one hundred and twenty thousand today. And numerous friends and family members each received a thousand dollars or twenty thousand today, and five thousand or a hundred thousand today. The Borden House was sold in May of twenty twenty for one point eight million. And it's now a museum and a bed and breakfast restored to exactly how it was at the time, complete with crime scene photos. You can stay there. You can no, stay. No, thank you. Yeah, no, you thanks. can stay in the murder uh, house. Yes. I will pass. Thank you. There's also um, evidence from the trial, including the axe head and mock-ups of the skulls. Oh, God. Um, Some people are weird. I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, although she was acquitted at the trial, Lizzie remains the prime suspect in her father and stepmother's murder. Uh-huh. Murders. Uh, writer Victoria Lincoln proposed in 1967 that Lizzie might have committed the murders while in a fugue state. She was on morphine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, another prominent suggestion was that she was physically and sexually abused by her father, which drove her to kill him. Mm-hmm. There is little evidence to support this, but incest is not a topic that would have been discussed at the time. Yeah. Uh, and the methods for collecting physical evidence would have been very different in 1892. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this belief was intimated uh, in local papers at the time of the murders and was revisited by scholar Marcia Carlisle in a 1992 essay. Um, mystery author Ed McBain, in his 1984 novel Lizzie, suggested that Lizzie committed the murders after being caught in a lesbian, lesbian tryst with Maggie. There's been several reports of this. Uh, McBain elaborated on, uh, on on his speculation in a 1999 interview that Abby had caught Lizzie and Sullivan together and had reacted with horror and disgust so that Lizzie had killed Abby with a and that, that Lizzie had killed Abby with a candlestick. When Andrew returned, she confessed to him but killed him in a rage with a hatchet when when he reacted as badly as Abby had. Right on. Uh, McBain further speculates that Sullivan. Uh, disposed that, that Maggie disposed of the hatchet somewhere afterwards. Uh, yeah, I like the fugue state theory. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and right. The, 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 too many moving parts in that. I don't know. <laughs> there were, but in, in, her, in her later years, Lizzie was yeah. rumored to be a lesbian. Right. Um, there was no such speculation about Maggie, who did find uh, another job after the murders, and she la- later married a man while working as a maid in Butte, Montana. Right on. Uh, Maggie would die in Butte in eight, 1948. Wow, she good was a long time. Wow. Uh, where she allegedly gave a deathbed confession to her sister, stating that she had changed her testimony on the stand in order to protect Lizzie. Wow. Hmm. Uh, another significant suspect is Uncle John, mm-hmm. um, who rarely met with the family after his sister died, but he slept in the house the night before the murders. Uh, according to law enforcement, John had provided an absurdly perfect and over-detailed alibi for the death of Abby Borden. He was considered a suspect by police for a period, but then dismissed. Uh, Other notable potential suspects in the crime include Maggie, possibly in retaliation for being ordered to clean the windows on a hot day when she was sick. (laughs) Uh, You know, the day of the murders, it was unusually hot. Right, exactly. Uh, Although Emma had an alibi uh, for being at Fairhaven. Remember, this was about 15 miles from Fair River. Uh, crime writer Frank Spearing proposed in his 1984 book, Lizzie, that she might have secretly visited the residence to kill her parents before returning to Fairhaven to receive the telegram informing her of the murders. Right on. Um, the last thing I have here, there was the 48 Hours documentary I saw. And at the end of that, they did a mock trial with a jury of men and women in 2020 to see if the outcome was the same. Uh-huh. Uh, they used seasoned attorneys to present the case. And they hired a jury recruiting firm to select a jury of people who had never heard of Lizzie Borden. Okay. Uh, they could only use evidence that was presented what? at the original. Go ahead. How do you? Wow. I, 
Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's why they've got jury recruiting firms. That's that's the weirdest thing I've heard yet. I agree. Heard about this whole thing. Go ahead. Uh, the attorneys were only able to use evidence presented at the original trial. Um, and, and and it was very interesting to watch as they went through it. I, I was very interested because one was, uh, one was a, uh, I think, a 12-year prosecutor. One was a defense attorney. I mean, it was really, really good to see it um, and, and watch the jury reaction. And the cool thing was... We got to sit in the room while the jury deliberated with oh, him, right. too. Which, so, yes. so that was oh, really yeah. cool. Uh, mock trial, yeah. Right. And the lawyers did, too. They got to see, you know, how the mm-hmm. case was presented and everything. Uh, the, jury did deliver, did, d- the jury did deliberate, but they ended up being a hung jury as they could not unanimously declare, declare Lizzie guilty. Yeah. And that is wow. the story of Lizzie Borden. That's... Wow. I, okay, they, oh, I, I had always assumed I knew a lot about Lizzie Borden. I did not know she, I'm like you, I didn't know she'd been acquitted. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I knew before, she, got, she was acquitted. And I didn't. Know. When I heard it, the, the first time I heard it was on the History Chicks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I didn't know she was acquitted either. I, I'd always thought that she was found guilty. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, because because of the, of the limerick. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. that's well, what I was. There was that movie with Elizabeth McGovern back in the late seventies. Right. The yes. Movie, yeah. Yeah. Where she got off at the end. Yeah. Of yeah. They, they they had talked about that in my research too. I didn't put in about the movies and, and whatnot, but uh, but yeah, I'd, I I'd really been interested to cover Lizzie on my own. Yeah. And 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 see what I could find and see could I you know could I present a story about Lizzie Borg because I, I think it's a fascinating story. You know the, the I think I I latched onto the burning the dress too because I did you too. Know, you, you know back then fabric was expensive mm-hmm. and people knew it was really hard to get. So if you had a dress that had paint on it, you cut the paint part out and keep the rest of it for. Anything else? I mean, you know, rag keeping rags was a thing. Well, many of know? the stories presented Emma and Libby, Lizzie um, as they wanted to live beyond what their father provided. Yeah. Yeah. They felt they should live up on the hill. They, they, felt they wanted to live the way the the, they wanted yes. to live like the money that their dad yes. had, not like the money that. Yeah. And so that may be kind of part of it where Lizzie is like, right. oh, I put paint on it. I'm done. I'm going to burn this because because both Emma and Lizzie were painted as very yeah. kind of. Well, then that, then having two cars in the 1920s when she died, that's a lot of cars for the 1920s. Yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> that's, that's one more than almost everybody had. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, two more than almost everybody yes, had, really. Yes, most people um, had, yeah. yeah. So good. Glad I, glad I got to teach you all something today. Oh, Thank was, you, sir. Yeah, that was fun. Cool. That's a wild ride, too. I, I, I thought I knew everything about this. <laughs> well, great. Hopefully, I presented it well. Um, so that's uh, that. That'll take us to the end of our show again. Uh, Trey, thank you so much oh, for being a guest host. Back, Trey. Thanks for having me back. Um, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna just say it here. Trey, welcome in. Zig, oh. you're done. <laughs> no, I'm, kid- I'm kidding. I, I, w- I wouldn't get rid of. You. I wouldn't get rid of my buddy. Uh, so no, thank you very much. Very oh, much. Very appreciate. It. Love thanks learning for about it. Me, man. Um, you know, as, uh, as as we end this week as normal, you can find our information, uh, how to contact us on our website nerdyandmurdy dot com. You can get uh, show links, which we will have for this episode, pictures. Um, as well as you can find our merchandise. Mm-hmm. You can find all of our social media. Uh, you can find our Patreon, where if you like hearing quality programming like the ones you've yes. just heard, please consider donating to our cause. There you go. There. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. We appreciate all of our patrons. Our patrons help uh, help keep this going. Uh, so we very, very much appreciate you. We appreciate all of you. Please don't forget to send us comments on the show, uh, ideas for things you want to hear. We do enjoy yes, covering those. We want to get better. Absolutely. We want to hear, we want to hear all of it, no matter what. Um, so yeah, that takes us to the end of this week. And with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. No, you fucking you, slanderous bastard. Shut you, up. You haven't. I've been Trey. There we go. The nerdery. I've been Zig with the color commentary. That's better. Thank you both. And I've been Jeffrey with your murdery. Cue the music.